ghost is definitely Lincoln, which is uh, interesting to me. Abraham Lincoln, of course, uh, had, had the most difficult presidency. There's no one that's even a close second uh, to Lincoln. His son died while he was in the White House, that's died right. in the White House. You know, so his his family, su- yeah, right, suffered a, a horrible tragedy. The nation's at war with itself. He's got, you know, a, a nation at civil war, which is, it, it can't get any harder than that, I imagine, for a president where you've got thousands of people dying on both sides. And of course, he paid the ultimate price for the office he was assassinated. And you consider all that, um, you know, it, it, it kind of makes some degree of sense. Also, the first ghost reports were during the Lincoln presidency. Mary Todd Lincoln wrote about her mm-hmm. son saying he, he comes to visit her in the night. Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome to Night Fright. Tonight on Night Fright, ghost stories. Oh, yeah. Snowing like crazy out there in the middle of a snowstorm. You're stranded somewhere. Put the fireplace on. Settle back in a nice comfy chair. Jeff Belanger's here. We're going to be talking about his book, Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Let me read this first. Jeff Belanger has been studying and writing about the supernatural for regional and national publications since 1997. He's the founder of ghostvillage.com. Go check it out, folks, or just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Click on Jeff's link. Uh, You'll see his his name is blue and underlined. Just click on that. It's highlighted. Take you right to ghostvillage.com. The largest supernatural community on the web. And the author of more than 10 books, including The World's Most Haunted Places, Our Haunted Lives, and The Ghost Files. Monsieur Boulanger lectures throughout the United States and has appeared on more than 100 radio and television programs worldwide, including the History Channel, the Travel Channel, Living TV in the UK, The Maury Show, the CBS News Early Show, National Public Radio, the BBC, Australian Radio Network, Coast to Coast AM, and I'm going to ask him about that, if he was on with George or if he was on with um, Ian, and the X-Zone. He currently haunts Massachusetts with his family. And we'll get into all that in a second. So tonight on Night Fright, folks, Jeff Belanger joins us and settle back. We're going to have a great time talking about ghost stories. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark. For Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. And a good, good evening, one and all. Welcome to Night Fright. It's Brent Holland. Tonight on the show, Jeff Belanger. Jeff Belanger has a great book out called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Now, that's the first directory of its kind to be written by dozens of the world's leading paranormal investigators. Research notes, location, background, first-hand accounts, interviews with leading paranormal researchers, and many anomalous photographs featuring ghostly manifestations comprise the hundreds of haunted listings in this directory there's canadian hauntings folks i've read the book there are hauntings in cambodia right around the world this is a global directory it's really really well put together now in its second edition the encyclopedia of haunted places has been updated with dozens of new listings new information on existing haunts and a comprehensive directory of paranormal investigators i want to welcome tonight fright for the very first time and definitely not the last my buddy jeff belanger jeff welcome to the show thanks for joining us brent thanks for having me on good evening good evening to you how's the weather uh it's snowy rainy and yucky yeah pretty much the same here minus the rain yeah yeah but a lot of the yucky is going on right now actually as i speak and i look out the window so you know what though it's i mean it's december it's a great time for ghost stories it certainly is 
It certainly is. Edgar Allan Poe knew it. I remember the bleak December. I mean, think of all the old Christmas carols, uh, you know, the yeah. scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. It's a tradition that kind of went away, and it's too bad. It's too bad. Think of Scrooge. Oh, of course. Yeah. Charles Dickens, one of the greatest classic. ghost stories ever written. It's a classic. Right. Now, what got you into the paranormal? Was there something that took place in your life that kind of triggered that and said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to go in this direction? Or No, I just was figuring, how could I get myself on radio shows? And uh, <laughs> I think it couldn't be easier, frankly. It couldn't be easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, now, I now need to set my bar much higher because <laughs> this was way too easy. Uh, no, I, I grew up in an old New England town and, and had friends from a young age who said, you know, my, ho- my house is haunted. And so we'd have sleepovers and go ghost hunting at age 10, um, break out Ouija boards and try to make contact. And what really got me hooked yeah, was, yeah, yeah. yeah, not so much, you know, that their houses were haunted, but it wasn't like a Hollywood story. There was no blood dripping out of the walls. No mm. one was getting possessed. It was just, yeah, someone else lives here with us and we can't always see him. And I thought that was so intriguing. And I, be, I went to school to be a writer, to be a journalist, and I started in newspapers. And around October, you go looking for these kinds of stories. And what got me hooked is, uh, not only researching the history and finding sometimes it indeed backs up what these people are reporting, but when you interview enough people and you get a sense for for who's full of it, who's delusional, who's on drugs, and who's really been shaken to the core by something they've experienced, you you start to get a sense of that. And I realize, wow, there's something to this. This, If not real, it's perceived as real by millions of people, and that's something I wanted to understand. Absolutely. When you were 10 years old back in that haunted house, did you ever find anything you'd like to tell the listeners about? I don't know. You know, the Ouija board planchette moved around, uh, that's for sure. I, you know, whether it was me pushing it or him pushing it uh, collectively or, mm-hmm. or something else, mm-hmm. I still don't know. I, I've only had about three experiences in my life, and I've been doing this for a long time now. Gosh, I've been writing about it, publishing on the paranormal since at least 15 years. Uh, I've been doing my website since 1999, you know, 10 years of, of looking at publishing about ghosts there and, and doing this full time for the last five. And uh, and I can tell you, in all that time, three experiences I can't really explain. So, which leads me to believe, I think it's pretty rare. Although I do accept some people are more sensitive to this than others, and then there's people like me who are psychically insensitive, which anyone who knows me well will, will agree. I am indeed an insensitive person, but uh, <laughs> but at the same time, does your wife I, tell you that? By the way. <laughs> Not so much, but she's not a, you know, she's not a psychic, so. I'm teasing you, I'm teasing you. <laughs> it's a fair question, but no, I, I think I think it's a rare phenomenon, but I think it, it does occur. I think there's something to it. Mm-hmm. We don't know everything about how the world works. We don't know everything about science. Um, you know, I, I know some of this stuff doesn't fall into under our current understanding of science, and, uh, and I think that's intriguing. And one of the other parts I love about it is that when I was in college, I just about became an atheist. I, I don't think I ever quite crossed that line into atheism, but I was close. And then I, because I just, you know, I, I think like a lot of people, you know, you start to think too much about religion and all the wars and violence and all the horrible things that have come from this man-made, you know, creation mm-hmm. called religion. Mm-hmm. And I said, wow, you know, ghost encounters are kind of like the least common denominator of spirituality because Jews see ghosts and Christians see ghosts and mm-hmm. Muslims, Hindus, even atheists have, have these experiences. And if we can, but we can talk about that. It's more safe than, than talking about these elaborate belief systems. So maybe there is something to it. And if there are ghosts, well, then what? What else is out there? And so I, that's kind of my own spiritual journey and, and where it's led me so far. Exactly. It's more of a, a journey than so a point you've reached. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, I'm so far from done. I, I thought, I, I actually realized, I, I I think I knew more 10 years ago than I know now. I've, I've, I'm losing knowledge somehow along the way. Uh, it was so so much easier, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Ghosts, haunted places, history, that was it. And, and the more you study this, the more you start to realize, well, gee, you know, religion and perception and psychology and sociology and all these other aspects come into the paranormal because one person's ghost is another person's space alien is another person's Bigfoot is another person's coincidence. Exactly. Exactly. I would like you to tell us a little bit about one of the most haunted places in North America, the White House. Yeah, God, that's a good one. I, I love the White House for a number of reasons. One, it's just so full of history, history that's still being written every day. You know, it's still making history. And when you step into that building, it's really an amazing place. It's, uh, you, you know, you feel it, you live it, you breathe it. Uh, you know, to stand in the, under the North Portico and know that every single U.S. president stood where you're standing, mm-hmm. with the possible exception of George Washington. 
Washington who who died before it was complete, but still was there for the laying of the cornerstone and and you know probably stood where you're standing anyway. Uh, it's just it's it's an incredible place. And what I love about it is that you've got such credible witnesses. I mean, that's one of the things that skeptics are are very quick to attack is the credibility of the witness, which is fair. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, some people are confused, but at the White House. Now, I don't mean the presidents and, and their families and their, their administration. Those people can be nuts and on drugs. I don't even think they drug screen uh, to the elected president. <laughs> <laughs> Depending so on the dis- president, I may agree with you. <laughs> so, so we can discount all that. However, yeah. if you work there, and there's about 100 employees who work for that building, uh, and these are people, some of them are, are generational. I met a third-generation butler. His dad was a butler at the White House. His dad's dad was a butler at the White House. These people stay. And, and it doesn't matter what political party's in power. These folks have a job. They're drug screened. They're psych screened. They're background checked. Um, they're, they're checked in all other ways because they're around the president, the first family, and foreign heads of state. So these people need to be on the up and up. And when they say, I've seen something, they've got nothing to gain. Uh, by by sharing that information, and uh, and and I I believe them. I believe them beyond mm-hmm. presidents in their cabinet um, when they have exper- when they say they have experiences, and, and that's the kind of stuff that turns up at the White House. Pretty cool. Can you give us one of those examples? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the most prominent ghost is definitely Lincoln, which is uh, interesting to me. Abraham Lincoln, of course, uh, had had the most difficult presidency of all of them. There's no one that's even a close second uh, to Lincoln. Mm-hmm. You know, he, his son died while he was in the White House. Right. Died in the White House. You right. know, so his Scarlet family, su- yeah, yeah, right, suffered a, a horrible yeah. tragedy. The nation's at war with itself. He's got you know a, a nation at civil war, which is it, it can't get any harder than that. I imagine for a president where you've got thousands of people dying on both sides. And of course, he paid the ultimate price for the office he was assassinated. And you consider all that, um, you know, it, it, it kind of makes some degree of sense. Also, the first ghost reports were during the Lincoln presidency. Mary Todd Lincoln wrote about her mm-hmm. son saying he, he comes to visit her in the night. Mm-hmm. And you might dismiss that because Mary Todd Lincoln, if you read about her historically, certainly seems to have uh, some some very <laughs> various issues uh, psychologically speaking. However, uh, in 1901-1902, a little boy's ghost turns up again in the journals of a military aide who said, uh, while visiting the White House, he was told by the staff that they see the ghost of a little boy. And you say, huh, there was only one little boy to ever die in that White House, and that was mm-hmm. Willie Lincoln. So kind of interesting that he comes up again decades after the Lincolns had, had left. Um, you know, interesting stuff. So Abe Lincoln, uh, you know, pays the ultimate price, and he's been spotted, experienced in, in other ways by staff members, by you know other people who have been inside the White House. There's a foreman who talked about walking down the, the hallway on the second floor one evening, and, uh, excuse me, one morning, turning the lights on as part of his morning duties. And he said right outside of the Lincoln bedroom, he saw Abraham Lincoln sitting on a chair with his legs crossed, arms folded, and looked at him and then disappeared. Oh. And and you say, okay, this is a this is a guy who works at the White House. So number one, kind of credible. Number two, we know what Lincoln looks like. There's no mistaking him. Mm-hmm. He's he's so distinct. He's on our money. <laughs> you know, we, mm-hmm. we look at him mm-hmm. every time we, you know, hit the fast food restaurant. Uh, so we know what he looks like. We're in the context, and then he disappears. And the Lincoln bedroom, of course, was never Lincoln's bedroom. It used to be the executive office long before the East and West wings were. Oh added. no, you so, see, I didn't know that, Jeff. You just yeah, educated so, me. So that was that would have been his office, not his bedroom, and uh, and I and, and read, of course where he would be um, if if he were still hanging around. And what I think is so interesting about ghosts is there's there's so many ways they serve us and we serve them, and and, and in all other ways, do do we keep them hanging around? Are they some kind of collective thought form? Uh, I remember seeing an interview with uh, George Bush the senior, a, mm-hmm. a president, who said, you know, he was thinking about one of the first times he had to send troops into harm's way in, in military mm-hmm. action. And he said, you know, he was he was so distraught over the decision. And then he thought about Abe Lincoln and what he had to go through. And he said it just kind of gave him some peace. And you say, wow, I wonder, do these presidents need his spirit around? Do they think about him? Do they, do they keep him hanging around? Does Abraham Lincoln stick around? Or do we just think about him so much that we imagine it and we imagine it almost to the point of hallucinating it or projecting it into reality in, in some way. I, I, you know, the, those are the mysteries that I'll probably work on the rest of my life. But at the same time, people report 
things happening in a building where nothing out of the ordinary is supposed to happen unless it's been documented and checked and triple checked and recorded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now, and now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, our guest tonight is Jeff Melanger. Jeff Melanger, of course, is a, a ghost researcher, a ghost author. He's written a great book called Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. If you go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, you're going to see his book cover there, just beside the synopsis of tonight's show. Just click on that. That'll take you to Chapters Indigo right across the country. Just order it right online, or if you want, just go into any Chapters Indigo. I saw it there at our own Chapters Indigo. Just to let you know, Jeff, Chapters Indigo is a Canadian yeah. version of, uh, you know what, okay. Oh, sure, yeah, of course. Okay, and um, I checked it out today, and uh, there it is, right there on the Kingsway here in Sudbury, so you won't have any problems whatsoever getting the book, and it is well-documented, well-written. It's going to keep you up late at night. Leave those <laughs> lights on. <laughs> but it, you bring forth something that has always intrigued me also, the mystery, the possibilities of more than what we're seeing, what we're physically uh, touching what we're physically seeing, hearing, all the, you know, all the elements put together, there's something more there. And when more and more people start seeing the same things, you kind of look at yourself and you go, am I the only one not seeing them now? So maybe at one point during our lifetimes, it'll become commonplace. Do you feel that there is a convergence going on? Do you feel both sides are converging now more than ever? I, you know, I don't know much about the other side. I, I, um, you know, I haven't died yet, but, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do know that this topic is going more and more mainstream. Uh, even though you know those of us that are, are in it and have been in it keep saying, you know, God, it, it's got to, it's got to implode on itself here. You know, the interest in the paranormal has always been there. It's been there for millennia, and it will continue to be there. But it seems to to vary. You know, we get into UFOs for a while, and then we get into ghosts, and then we get into other monsters. And, you know, those of us into this keep saying, how many more TV shows on ghosts can they possibly produce before the public just goes, enough, enough with the ghosts. I believe in ghosts. Leave me alone. You know, I don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, so I, I think one of the big factors is that it's not it's not weird to talk about them anymore because they're on every television network going. Um, you know, it, even Animal Planet has got, it, the Animal Planet TV network has got, you know, a ghost show. <laughs> so, so you're allowed to talk about it. Um, around the water cooler, whereas 15 years ago, if you were in the office going, hey, you know, I, I think I had a ghostly experience this weekend, you, you might get fired and locked up or whatever. And mm-hmm. uh, that's just not the case Ostracized. anymore because, mm-hmm. yeah, because it's gone so yeah. mainstream. And so because we're allowed to talk about it, um, uh, people are sharing more. And so are there most more ghost experiences occurring today than there were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? I kind of don't think so. I just think we're talking about it more. Um, so call it a convergence, call it a, an enlightening, call it a fad. <laughs> I, I really don't know, but I do know that, that people are coming forth. And, uh, and, and, you know, if you look at the polls, you know, God, the big polling companies that ask people about this stuff, the numbers continue to rise decade after decade. You know, when you include, what about all those experiences that you just can't explain? What about those dreams that seem like they were more than dreams? What about those those coincidences that seem more than just random chance. Uh, I think most people, if they search their heart, would say, yeah, I've had an experience or two that I will just never be able to explain. Though I remain skeptical of ghosts or monsters or whatever, there's there's forces at work in the universe that uh, I don't fully understand just yet. And and that's and that's what we're talking about here. That's, that's all part of it. Absolutely. I'd like to get you to speculate now. What is a ghost? What is your definition of a ghost? Man, that's a, that's that's the big question, isn't it? And, yeah. and I, you know, I, I wrote another book called uh, The Ghost Files, where I tried to answer that. And the best I've come up with so far is is ten different categories, <laughs> which uh, which could take quite a while. But but it varies. Everything from uh, I think the most simple explanation is a ghost is a connection to our past. It's a way for us to connect with each other, 
living people in our present, That's and it's a way to discuss our own inevitable future because newsflash, yeah. we're all going to die. It's one of the two guarantees yes. we get in life besides taxes. Besides taxes, yeah. Right, and and so uh, and so so that's what a ghost is. It's a lot of things. I mean, could it be something residual, an imprint left on a location that just plays like a movie over and over? Maybe. Uh, you know, if you if you study a bit about quantum physics and learn that time is right. not necessarily linear, you know, wow, wouldn't that explain a lot of ghost experiences? Maybe you're just seeing the past for a brief glimpse and you perceive it as a ghost. Uh, maybe, you know, grandma died and is still hanging around until someone finds her jewelry hidden under the bed, you know, <laughs> uh, some unfinished business that she simply must see to before mm-hmm. she allows herself to move on to whatever is next. I, I have no idea. I, it, it's, it, I think there's as many theories as there are ghost stories. Well, this begs another question then. Do you feel there's a difference between a simple ghost and demons? Oh, demons. I love demons. You do. I love them. Okay. I, uh, I actually uh, I call myself a Satanologist now because demonology gets to be so trendy. I figure, well, I got to up the ante. I'm going to be a Satanologist. <laughs> so don't get me out of bed unless it's the big dog. You know, if you got these minor demons, call the other guys. But uh, <laughs> when you've got dog. Satan himself, you ring me up and uh, and I'm on the job. Um, demons, you know, I I don't know. There's been some pretty awful people that have walked our planet <laughs> since uh, humans first, uh, first first stepped out of Africa all those years ago. Um, awful people, and and I would even accept the label of, of demon Jeffrey Dahmer. You know the mass murderer. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to call him a demon? That seems like a perfectly legitimate label to me. Mm-hmm. And if he died, and if he could still hang around here, I imagine he's he's still a horrible, you know demonic type person. And so if that's the case, then sure, you know, you, you can use that as a label. However, when you start labeling things demons, you're getting into belief system, belief systems and even imposing belief systems on people. Um, you know, some people are raised that you just don't mess with this stuff. So if there's a strange knock on the wall, anything anything out of the ordinary either comes from God or it comes from the devil. And so there could be a knock on the wall and someone says, my God, it's a demon. And someone else could look and say, no, that's where your hot water pipe runs up and it's an exterior <laughs> wall and it's cold out and it's mm-hmm. kicking. And, and it, but, it, but it's the perception of the witness is what, is what we go by. And if that witness is raised in a strict you know, religious belief system, they're going to do their best to interpret anything that goes on like a strange knock on the wall. And, uh, and, and then they might call it a demon. Uh, that's not to say that they're, you know, they're not out there. Maybe they are. I've never, I, you know, I, I had one as a boss. I may have dated one. Um, but in, in, in ghost research, I don't think I've come across one yet. I think I dated her sister also. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> more and more with the advent of digital technology, digital cameras, digital video cameras, there's a lot of EVPs coming in now. Uh, sure. Four of them. Once again, do you think that that could be just people caught up in this hysteria, or do you think there's actual credibility to some of these sightings? I I think it's interesting. I mean, myself, I can't even spell EVP. I mean, you know, I, I've I've tried this. I, I see how it's done. You know, you hold a recorder up, you see what you get. Um, I think most most of them, I, I think, are people kind of reaching. You know, when you play something and it goes, wah, 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 see, it says, I'm here behind you. And you go, what? Really? I didn't hear that. I heard nothing. <laughs> you know, I heard just gibberish. Mm-hmm. Um, those don't interest me, not even a little. Um, but when it's crystal clear, meaning you could play it for 10 different people independently and just say, what does this say? And all 10 would agree. Um, those are interesting where it's as clear as a voice. Now, of course, you have to trust the person taking it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors at work here, but when it's within context of where you are and what you're discussing, and it's a voice that wasn't in the room, boy, I don't know how else to explain it, and if not otherworldly, and I think that's some really interesting evidence. We don't have proof. I don't know if we ever will you know, have proof that, that converts everybody, but uh, but I think it's really interesting evidence, And uh, but I do think a lot of people get caught up in the hysteria of it, because it, these are people that fancy themselves as ghost hunters. Mm -hmm. And and if you hunt something, I mean, if you were a deer hunter and you went out there every weekend and you never even saw one week after week, year after year, I'm guessing eventually you would just give up deer hunting. You you need to bring back something. So if someone goes and they're really, you know, looking for that profound peace experience, 
well, eventually maybe their threshold keeps lowering to the point where it <laughs> is enough. And, <laughs> maybe uh, to the point where they shoot a, you know, a rabbit or something can come back and say, see the deer I saw, I shot. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. And that's, that's a good analogy. And so, you know, if you keep lowering that threshold, eventually, um, you know, you're going to come back with something and, and maybe that, and, and that, you know, we all have a different belief threshold and, and I think mine's quite high. Others, I think is too low. Um, but, no, that's what makes the world a wonderful place. We're all different. Absolutely. Folks, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Jeff Belanger tonight. Jeff Belanger has written a terrific book called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. He also has a website that you can go to called ghostvillage.com, www.ghostvillage.com. Jeff, stick with me. It's coming up to the bottom of the hour. I just have to do this quick break. It's university slash community radio, but the show is syndicated right across the country. Canada. What I do is I just read out the call letters of the stations that are syndicating the show. So it takes about five, six, seven minutes. If you want, you can just grab a quick uh, beer. If you want, <laughs> your choice. I was going to say coffee, but uh, certainly if you want to get a beer, go ahead and. Uh... <laughs> I'm on it. Okay, man. Just come back when you're ready. All right. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Okay, folks, you're listening to Brent Holland, and the show is Night Fright, of course. You are also listening to CKLU 96.7 FM, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, where it is blistery tonight. That's the best way to describe it. Bundle up, get a comforter, get in your most comfortable chair. We've got an amazing guest tonight, Jeff Belanger, a very knowledgeable fellow. He's been doing it for over 10 years, since 1997, and we're discussing all things ghostly. He's going to be telling us some more stories, and uh, his book, of course, is called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places, and it can be got at Chapters Indigo right across the country. If you go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, you can just click on the book cover right there. That'll take you to Chapters Indigo right across the country. Cape Radio, Cape Breton University, Sydney, Nova Scotia, Wednesdays from 3.30 in the afternoon to 5.30 in the evening. I want to say hi to my friend Matthew Burke. The only reason why this show stays on the air, folks, is because of one person, Deborah Franco. Every week she finds the money from God knows where to pay for these long-distance phone calls. This is a volunteer radio station. I'm a volunteer. Nobody makes a dime off this show. But every week she finds the money and there's no money. I mean, it's a volunteer gig, right? There's no money. So I really want to give kudos to her because she finds that money. She virtually dances through hoops to find it. And I want to thank her from the bottom of my heart. CILU 102.7 FM, Lakehead University in Rock and Thunder Bay, Ontario. Monday nights at midnight. What a great time to listen to Night Fright in the middle of the night. Jason Wellwood. Merry Christmas, my friend. Hope things are well with you. Over in Quebec now, in Sherbrooke, Quebec, an hour south of my old hometown of Montreal, David Teasdale has a radio station called The Voice of the Eastern Townships. Its call letters are CJMQ 88.9 FM. And if you're listening right now, merci beaucoup. Vous êtes très gentil et joyeux Noël, tout le monde. And CJUM 101.5 FM, University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Beautiful Winnipeg, Manitoba. Thank you so much for listening and supporting Night Fright and making us the number one Canadian-based show of its genre right across the country. That's wonderful news. Thank you so much, everybody, from all the stations that all our affiliates right across the country and all our listeners make that possible. So I do thank you so much. want to say hi to Jared McKittiak. Sound FM, 100.3 FM, University of Waterloo, Waterloo, Ontario. Sunday nights, Monday mornings, three shows back-to-back, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I want to say hi to my good buddy, Road Dog, and wish him a very, very, Merry Christmas. CKXU 88.3 FM, University of Lethbridge in Lethbridge, Alberta. Friday nights at midnight to 2 a.m. Alan Gillespie, hope things are well with you. My good buddy, Amos Evans, the University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, B.C. Nymphs are coming, guys. Going to be here very soon. Thursdays at 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Friday mornings at 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. CIVL 88.7 FM, CFAD 92.1 FM in Salamo, that's Salamo Radio in Salamo and Ymir, British Columbia, Saturday evenings from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. 
want to say hi to Gerald Hutchman, the Hutch Christopher Earl over at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, British Columbia, of course. Friday nights, Monday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. And that's CFUR 88.7 FM, CFXU 93.3 FM, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Saturdays at 10 to midnight. Want to say hi to Kurt Wetter. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Now, I want to point you directly to the Night Fright website. www.nightfrightshow.com www.nightfrightshow.com There you will find a plethora of things. You will find photos. You will find the archives. Probably the most important thing on the website, the archives. All the shows we've done for over a year now are archived. They're free for you to download. Just go there, download them for free. Stick them on your iPods. uh, If you're off taking the metro somewhere, going to school, stick them on your iPod and off you go. Truckers going across the country love this stuff. They stick it on their iPods also and just listen to it right across the country as they go from one coast to the other. All that stuff is there for you free. There are shows on the Kennedy assassination. There's a whole series on the Kennedy assassination. We had first-person witnesses on. Dr. Robert McClellan treated John F. Kennedy four minutes after Kennedy was shot. Uh, They just rushed him right to Parkland Hospital at Dallas, Texas, and he was the doctor that worked on him. Many people think Kennedy was dead when he arrived. He was not dead. He was not conscious. His brain was gone, unfortunately. But he still had a heartbeat. And when you've got the President of the United States lying there in front of you, well, you pull out the stops. And he tells how they tried in vain to resuscitate the fallen president. That shows there. Living history, folks. Could you? We had mentioned Lincoln before and Lincoln's ghost. Could you imagine being able to speak with the doctor who worked on Lincoln? Well, that's exactly what we did with JFK. So there you go. All that's there for you to download for free. There's shows on Bigfoot. Special broadcast coming up December 23rd. John Hogue will be here telling his predictions for 2010. And if it's anything like John Hogue predictions from the past, we are in for one heck of a ride that night and in 2010. Next week, we've got John Robert Colombo coming on to talk about his big book, Canadian ghost stories. And that should be quite interesting. As you all know, he's an Order of Canada winner. All kinds of things there. www.nightfrightshow.com www.nightfrightshow.com Enjoy yourselves there. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Right now, we're speaking with Jeff Belanger. Jeff Belanger, of course, is an author. He's written several books, 10 books to be precise. He's been all over the place on radio, television, the History Channel, Coast to Coast AM. And I want to ask him about that, too, because George Norrie's been a guest here, and we're trying to get Ian Punnett on the show. Jeff, are you there, my friend? I'm here. Did you, uh, were you on the show with George or Ian? I was on with George. I've been on a few times, actually. Oh, that's great. Okay, isn't he a sweetheart of a guy? Oh, sure, yeah. In fact, I got to uh, hang out with him a little bit on the Queen Mary a few years ago. Oh, we're, we're uh, going to talk about that as I write down that note. Yeah, at the same, uh, we were both at the yeah, same yeah, conference yeah. one year and uh, got to talk a little bit. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Very, very yeah, nice absolutely. guy. Yeah, absolutely. So Jeff Belanger is with us tonight, and uh, as I said, he's been all over the, the place gathering these various stories and compiling them into this latest book of his called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Now, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover there. That'll take you right to Chapters Indigo. You can either order it online. should be there within 24, 48 hours. Talk about a great Christmas gift. Wow. There's one solved, or maybe two, or three, or four. There you go. I mean, if you know somebody that's into this, and everybody's into it these days, this is a great book for them to have. That's a great book for a stocking stuffer or a main gift. Terrific idea. You know, Jeff has done all kinds of research since 1997 on this. I want to ask him, though, now that we're back, what discerns a real true story for you as opposed to somebody who's just sending it in to see it in published form, in a book form? 
Well, I usually talk to everybody that I quote for, for my books. Um, I see. So it's at least on the phone. And uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I think I've got a pretty good BS detector. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, I've gotten emails from people that are just, you know, and then I was thrown against the ceiling, and, and they're describing anything I've seen in some cheesy Hollywood movie. And I mean, if it's true, wow! But it just didn't ring true, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I can't, I can't quantify you for you what the ring of truth is. It's just an internal, uh, internal device I use. Uh, I, but one of the things that that's most important to me is that um, it, when someone says, "Here's how you get my attention," when okay. you say. Nothing like this ever happened to me before this event, nor since. Then I'm I'm more interested. I'm not saying other people are lying. I'm just saying that that's more interesting to me. Uh, and when you can tell that the person's been shaken by it profoundly, that that this is this is a big yes. event. This is like yes. you know something that they can't get out of their head. They they have concerns about it. It keeps them up at night. Then my then I'm thinking they perceive this as real. And, and that that's worth some attention. That's worth uh, further time. Further time into it. Now, you mentioned the Queen Mary, of course. Several years ago, you were there. With, I know George was there, a uh, big conference there. Because the Queen Mary, folks, in case you're not aware of it, is a very, very haunted place. <laughs> two things, two questions for you. How was the conference for you? And can you tell us a story? Sure. Well, you got I've been to the Queen Mary four or five times by oh, now. Oh, you have? Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Gosh, there's a conference there probably every year, and I seem to be <laughs> out on the out on the boat each time. Um, it, it, it's a great place. It's a great ship. Uh, it's it's uh, it's one of the last great North uh, Transatlantic uh, ocean liners. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, the reason you say, well, why would an ocean liner be so haunted? Well, certainly, you know, there were accidents and drownings and heart attacks and things like that that would happen on any any ocean liner. But the Queen Mary was pressed into military service in uh, World War II. That's right. She, yeah, she was painted gray. She was given the nickname the Gray Ghost, and she was a troop ship. Now, this is a boat made to carry around 3,000 passengers and crew comfortably. And at one point, you would have upwards of 15,000 people on the boat uh, as a troop ship. There's there's pictures of this down in the Queen Mary Museum where literally there you had to take eight-hour shifts. You had to spend eight hours standing on the deck, doing nothing, shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of other people because that's the only place to put you. You it, The beds, every eight hours, someone was getting up and someone else was going down to sleep, uh, sometimes less. You know, you'd, you'd work if you could, you'd eat when you could, and you just had to stand. Um, it was just that packed. And this boat, oh, God, it carried prisoners of war. It was running zigzag patterns to evade German U-boats. And at one point, Mm -hmm. uh, a horrible event, there was an escort vessel called the Sirocco that was cut in half by the Queen Mary. And the Queen Mary had orders, do not stop. If you stop, you're a sitting duck. That's right. Uh, and so the, this, this smaller escort ship got in the way, was cut in half by the Queen Mary, and a lot of men died uh, from from that boat. Uh, horrible. But this is, you know, this is how World War II was. Everybody had to lend a hand as they could. So, um, so the ship made about, a, I believe, a thousand and one uh, transatlantic voyages before she retired, and was sent to Long Beach, California, where she's been uh, permanently moored ever since as a floating hotel. This was uh, in the late 60s, so it's been there for decades. The first time I went to the Queen Mary, I was probably about 12 years old and didn't even know it was haunted back then. Um, I was just out there for a family vacation and, mm-hmm. and went by it, and then been back many times since. When you're walking, and this is this is an interesting part of the, the haunting phenomenon to me, you walk into the Queen Mary, and it is a little bit like stepping back into another time period. You know, the, the, the 20s, the 30s, this, uh, you know, the, this... This, this different element, and I think that has a role in people's perceptions of, of ghosts there, you know, because your, your mind is now in the 1920s and 30s. It's not 2009 anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's 1933, and, and you're walking through, and you're up in the observation bar, and they've got old swing music playing quietly, and, mm-hmm. and it really sets the tone, and I, and I, I think that, ha- that has a part to it. Now, I got the chance to go down to the old second-class swimming pool and down into the cargo hold where you know, some of the prisoners of war were held at one point, And you can only imagine, because I was there on a, I don't know, gosh, when was the last time I was there? Something like September uh, in Long Beach. And it was warm. And when you get down into the cargo hole, it's pretty stuffy. Mm. Now, this boat was in the Indian Ocean. And it, it doesn't really have a, a good 
air circulating system, uh, especially back in the 1940s. It was never meant to, to sail in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And you had men that were just suffocating. It was just too hot and stuffy. Uh, prisoners of war were held down in the cargo hold and they were just dying. They were just expiring from, from the heat and, uh, and, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the stuffy conditions. And, and you go down there and I, you know, I understand that metal creaks and groans as, as temperatures change and things like that. But boy, there's just a feeling you get down there. It's a, it's just a heavy feeling. And, and, and like I said earlier, I can't stress enough how psychically insensitive I am. <laughs> uh, but there are certain places where you stand and I don't think it's so much to, about being psychic, but being human where you know what took place in that location. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, and you, and you pick up on that, you know, sit like you go to a place like Gettysburg, you know, these, these battlefields where thousands and thousands died in such a short period of time. And you just you feel that you, you, you pick up on it. It's a, it's a human thing. Have you been to Gettysburg? Oh yeah. I've uh, been to Gettysburg plenty. Um, you know, gosh, that, that's another place that if you're interested in history and ghosts, yeah. Uh, yeah. those two subjects pretty much intersect right in Gettysburg. So, yeah, I've been there a number of times. I used to live in Pennsylvania years ago. Oh, is that right? So, okay. yeah, I, um, I did get a chance to go out there plenty. And, uh, you know, here's, here's the other opportunity with ghosts. Ghosts are, can also be a teaching tool. You know, I know some people get really offended at the notion, um, you know, oh, how dare you, you know, uh, disrespect the memory of these men and, and women who died here. But I, I disagree. I think, as I said, a ghost is a direct connection to our past. If you're going to learn something, um, you know, especially to kids in school, what's more interesting? Well, Gettysburg, you know, 1863, July, 51,000 dead or wounded or lost. Those are just numbers and they're cold and they don't really mean much. But to say there's a ghost, well, it forces you to go back and say, well, who was this person? Well, that's a person with a, with a family, with a wife, with kids, with parents, yes. with brothers and sisters. And then you start to realize that it's a story. And, and now multiply that by 51,000, and it has a lot more impact than just raw statistics, which just, that's a disservice. Raw statistics are a disservice to people who, who gave their life for, you know, for those causes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these stories actually mean something. And, and, and is it haunted because it's history demanding to be remembered? I don't know. Part of the, the historian to me thinks so. But that's that's part of it. Is that you know to quote Abraham Lincoln, we cannot hollow this ground. The, you know the, the men and women who died here did this. You know far beyond our ability to do so. It's true, and it, it's still hollow ground. It's still it's still where the the spirits walk. We must remember what took place there, so it doesn't happen again. And uh, and I think that's one of the roles that these these ghosts fulfill for us. We can only hope it doesn't happen again. Now, this begs another question, and you talk about respectful. Have you received any accounts of any ghost sightings from 9-11 from the Twin Towers? You know, here's the thing. Uh, I know some psychics who have gone down there and claim that they're getting all kinds of feelings. Mm -hmm. Not for me to, to quantify that, because it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's one person who says they see something that I can't see, and so I, I, it's tough for me to... Uh, to be able to, to quantify it. That's one of those places. It, it's still, it's still too, too fresh, but I promise you a, a century from now, once we're safely away from the day, um, people will talk about it. Just like I, I'm sure it was too crass to talk about Gettysburg being haunted in 1870 or even 1880. Uh, but you get a few generations away where no one really is alive anymore who knew anyone there. And all of a sudden, you know, the ghosts come out. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm sure that's a location that people will talk about eventually, but wouldn't dare yet. We're two days after the day of infamy, December sure. 7th. There was another incident that took place in 1941. And many people don't know this, but again, in Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, that's one of the most haunted places also. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. Now, we have had ghost sightings there. And, yeah. and that's um, that's one of those things where we are starting to get, uh, you know, uh, the right distance away. Um, people have reported one of the one of the stories I've heard from uh, from the site um, uh, right above the, the USS Arizona is the um, that floating memorial. And people have reported seeing what looks like a sailor walking what would be a deck if it were there. So just kind of walking in midair. Uh, right about where a deck would have been, uh, back and forth keeping a watch. That's that's one of the, the prominent sightings I've heard from that location. And uh, and isn't that interesting? You know, you've yeah, got, still on duty, eh? 
still on duty, right? These, yeah. these people who died, you know, serving their country, serving their ship as best they could, and and maybe still duty bound. Uh, I think that that's um, again another way to appreciate and remember what took place there, right? Like you said, December seventh. Yeah, their sacrifices. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. One of the things in your book, folks, by the way, we're speaking with Jeff Belanger, just to let you know, and he's got a great book out called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. One of the things I like about your book is the fact that it's from all around the world. All these accounts are from around the world. One of the things that you mentioned that in the beginning of the show was that there's this commonality. It doesn't matter about religion, doesn't matter about ethnicity. Nothing of that matters. Language, nothing. Everybody has somewhere in their folklore some kind of paranormal story to tell. And how did you go about getting these stories from all around the world? I know Canada and the United States are pretty much side by side. So I imagine that was much easier than, say, there's one from Cambodia. Yeah, How did you yeah. get a story from Cambodia, for example? You know, here's here's what happens. Um, the good news is my job's getting easier <laughs> the, the, the further along in my career I get because uh, I've, I've become a magnet for these stories. I see. Uh, okay. So, you know, my the website has, has mm-hmm. been around for 10 years. And Go ahead and plug people. the website. Plug it. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's ghostvillage.com, and, and that's been around for 10 years now, and that's a long time on the Internet. Um, Absolutely. You know, it makes us kind of a grandfather. And so people who have these experiences go looking up stuff, and they find us, and then they email and share their own accounts. And so that's helped tremendously. Now, one of the things I did with this book, when when the publisher first asked me years ago, they said, what do you think about writing a big international directory? I said, oh, man, that's no way. That's too much work. You know, because to do this stuff right, you really want to get local when you can. Um, But then I thought about it, and I said, you know, there's paranormal research groups all over the country. Mm -hmm. And if we reached out to them and said, hey, write up the places you know best, and so we had over 100 contributors to wow. the book. Yeah, 100 different groups. And so people in Australia, people in Singapore mm-hmm. um, that research this stuff. And it's amazing how fast you can network when you say, well, you know, I'm looking for stories. I want to make sure we get Asia well covered. You know, Cause, because the, the challenge with writing this book wasn't just presenting interesting ghost accounts and, and ghost legends, but keeping it diverse. I didn't want a book full of cemeteries, you know, um, yes. or, or just abandoned hospitals. And I didn't want them all from just, uh, you know, Montreal. We had to be diverse by location, diverse by type of haunt, diverse by country. And so that was the challenge. You know, I, I, I can't tell you when the first book came out, people were emailing me saying, I can't believe you left this location out. They took it personal. There was, they were offended. <laughs> I said, I said, wow, and, and, and that's interesting to me because people feel mm-hmm. such a connection to some of these haunts. It's like family. You know, how, how dare you leave out Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky, yeah. which was, some, you know. I Isn't that like an that. interesting dynamic, though, that they feel so attached to these stories and the ghosts themselves? Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's what, you know, and that was the other thing that, that makes the job easier is the further along you go, people people love to point out your mistakes. <laughs> you know, they, they love to point out where they feel you fell short. That's the... Um, that's one of the uh, the upsides and downsides of being, uh, you know, having a job that's kind of out there in the public eye, like like writing and publishing material. <laughs> you know, people will uh, people will correct you if they feel that uh, you've done something wrong. And so, uh, so that was one of the things that people said. Well, I, you know, you didn't have any stories from this location or this country, and I heard this great tale about this, and and something inside you clicks. You go researching it, and you end up in Cambodia and mm-hmm. learning about this ancient city that's that's supposed to be, you know only left for the ghost now it's, it's an incredible uh, research task and folks that story by the way is in the encyclopedia of haunted places and if you want to pick up that book it's a great christmas gift christmas is coming really quickly now you can pick it up at chapters indigo right across the country or just go to the website www.nightfrightshow.com and click on the book cover take you right there jeff i want to ask you are you a horror movie fan oh yeah sure i love all that stuff and did you start off watching them when you were a kid oh yeah course okay what any favorites you know i the exorcist always oh um, man yeah you know like yeah. that one that one still works um <laughs> yeah. you know we were talking about demons earlier the whole idea of um, hang on a second i'm gonna go turn the lights on in the studio now <laughs> yeah good good you, you know here, here's the problem here's the other thing that that um, makes me nervous when when ghost researchers start talking about demons because yeah. 
when they go into someone's private residence and say, you know, oh yeah, we think there's a ghost here, people at some point can get their their hands around that and say, okay, well, a ghost was just a person like me who, you know, has some reason to be here and we'll just learn to get along. But a demon, well, they've seen the movies. They know the demon promises only one thing. I just want to hurt and kill you. <laughs> there's Big nothing problems, you can do. Yeah. <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing you can do to appease me. There's, there's nothing you can do. I just want to watch you suffer and, and hopefully die. And, and so um, one of the problems with, with uh, the paranormal in the media lately is that, you know, four or five years ago, ghosts were enough. That was scary. But then all these shows had to get darker. Well, ghosts aren't enough. We need to find demons. We need to find monsters that are actually out there attacking people. And, uh, you know, I don't know where you go from here. It's, it's do you think show about... I was going to ask you, do you think there's a danger there that people are looking for demons now? There's two aspects to it that they could actually find a real demon. But the other aspect, too, is they might get their head twisted around the fact that there's somebody with a mental illness. And all of a sudden, they're trying to do all these things to the person instead of actually getting them real help. Oh, God, that's the part that bugs me the most. You know, Nietzsche, of course, said uh, yes. you, know, you, you gaze long that's into right. the abyss. Eventually, yeah. the, the abyss gazes into you. And and, uh, and so that's one problem. If if I was dealing with a family member or someone I really cared about who truly believed that they had demons, and this is how I've dealt with this in the past when I, I have helped out with a few cases. Um, my My approach is, okay, that very well may be. There might be demons running all around. I'm not going to disagree with you. However... If this is a serious problem, and it, and it appears to be, people are sh shaken up, they're not sleeping, let's attack this problem from every single angle. Let's go see a medical doctor. Make sure all the medicine you're on isn't causing you any hallucinations or any problems. Let's get that checked out. Let's see a psychologist because at the very least, you might be dealing with something like post-traumatic stress disorder from mm. going through all this stress. You need to deal with that as well. Let's see your religious affiliate you know, leader. Let's see your imam, your priest, your rabbi. And, and deal with this on a spiritual level. And then, you know, let's look at your diet. Let's look at everything. And then all we can do is start taking items off the table. Now, of course, this, the suspicion is that, you know, well, gee, once you start dealing with the psychiatrist and the doctor, maybe we'll, we'll solve this. If we don't, wow, you know, then let's... Let's, uh, let's let, go to let's, the next let's, step. Yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let's go at this with all the guns blazing. But you can't just attack one problem until you know exactly what it is. And the only way to know is to put everything on the table, health, mental health, physical health, the environment. You know, do you have radon mm -hmm. leakage? Are you under high tension wires? You know, is, is, there, is there a gas leak somewhere? Let's look at all that, you know, and then, and then take it off the table and see what's left. Um, but see, and then as soon as someone gets offended by that, well, my thought is, well, then you don't really want help, and I'm not going to waste any more of my time. Uh, you know, if you're serious about getting help, then, you know, you, you should be looking into all of these avenues, not just, uh, you, you know, not just the paranormal, because that's one of the problems I've run into when you work on cases. People have problems. They have diabetes, mm -hmm. they're overweight, they're that's unemployed, right. and they want to blame demons or ghosts. If these demons were gone, my life would be okay. They don't want to hear that, no, you need to get healthy, you need to work hard, and you need to go find a job. Um, they want someone to come in, say a prayer, the demons are gone, and all those problems go away in, in one, you know, one swoop. And that's just not how it works. Wand. Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. And so that's that's the other thing that you run into is that people latch on to their, quote, demons because they need them. Because uh, without their demons, they have to deal with themselves, which is even worse than a demon. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is yeah. tricky, tricky ground when you, when you start talking about the paranormal. Absolutely. We've got to take another break now. You can go get another beer if you'd like. Oh, God. Number six. All right. <laughs> hey, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. That's right. But when we come back, I want to ask you if there's been one incident in particular that has stood out and bothered you over the years. Give you a little story, a little background story. I had Michelle Bedo Shea on the show. She's from Canada's Most Haunted, and she goes around and does investigations. But more than investigations, she actually does help people. And she said one of the things that freaked her out the most and is still bothering her to this day is one of the demons that she was dealing with through somebody that was a medium, if you will, called her name out personally. And that has really scared the bejesus out of her. So I want to find out if something like that has happened to you when we come back from the break. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. 
The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Jeff Belanger. And if you're anything like me, I've got the lights on, you know, and there's... <laughs> I've got the candles burning and the incense is going and I've got my cross out. We're really having a great discussion tonight. We're talking about all the details, if you will, of ghosts, where they come from, what makes up the content of a ghost. His book is called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. You can pick it up at any chapters Indigo across the country, of course, the www.nightfrightshow.com website. You can just click on the book cover there. That'll take you to chapters Indigo. Order it online. should be there within 24 or 48 hours. It makes a great Christmas gift for you. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Right now you're listening to CKLU 96.7 FM in Laurentian University, Sudbury, Ontario, where we broadcast Wednesday, 10 p.m. to midnight. Cape Radio, Cape Breton University, Sydney, Nova Scotia, Wednesdays from 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon to 5.30 p.m. In the afternoon, of course. And Caper Radio is in Sydney, Nova Scotia. And my grandfather was very fond of saying that's God's country. He was from the Rockies, a Maritimer. CILU 102.7 FM, Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Monday nights at midnight. And if you're listening right now, thank you so much. Great time to listen to ghost stories in the middle of the night in the dark. CJMQ 88.9 FM, the voice of the Eastern Townships. And that's in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Saturdays from 10 p.m. to midnight. CJUM 101.5 FM, University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Wednesday nights, Thursday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Sound FM 100.3 FM on the dial, University of Waterloo, Waterloo, Ontario. Three shows there, Sunday nights, Monday mornings, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. If you are going across the country on the Trans-Canada and you're listening right now, thank you very much. And I want to say hey to all the truckers out there listening to the show right now. I get your emails. Thank you for your guest suggestions. And just keep sending those emails in. Keep listening. Glad you do. CKXU 88.3 FM, University of Lethbridge in Lethbridge, Alberta. Beautiful place there. Friday nights at midnight to 2 a.m. CIVL 88.7 FM, University of the Fraser Valley, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Two shows, Thursdays from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. and Friday mornings from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. CFAD 92.1 Salamo Radio in Salamo and Ymir, British Columbia. British Columbia is gorgeous, absolutely stunningly beautiful. And if you guys are going out there for the Vancouver Olympics, have a blast. It's coming up real soon, Saturday night from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., CFUR 88.7 FM, University of Northern British Columbia, Prince George, British Columbia. Friday nights, Saturday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. CFXU 93.3 FM, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Saturdays from 10 to midnight. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. www.nightfrightshow.com www.nightfrightshow.com In the archives, you are going to find a plethora of shows. There was a show that we did during the Martin Luther King special we did last April by Lamar Waldron. And he talked at length about the connection between Montreal and the Martin Luther King assassination. And that connection was James Earl Ray, the purported assassin of Martin Luther King and how he was seen in Montreal. So what I did was last time I went to visit mom in Montreal, which was in June, I took pictures of where he was seen. I also took pictures of where another famous purported assassin was seen. You're not going to believe this, but Lee Harvey Oswald was also seen in Montreal just a few months before he was purported to kill President Kennedy. Now, I don't believe he did, but the connection in Montreal, there's one more connection that you may not be aware of. Ever heard of MK Ultra? In Montreal, 
there's a psychiatric hospital called the Allen Memorial Psychiatric Hospital. This hospital sits on top of a little hill in the middle of Montreal and overlooks the city. This was the location of the notorious MK Ultra mind control experiments, the CIA mind control experiments in the late 50s, early 60s. I took pictures of that also. It looks like a haunted house and when you walk by it, it just oozes evil. All that to say, those pictures are on the website. Just hit the photo section, take it right there. There are some more eerie connections. For example, one of the one of the psychiatrists that attended the Allen Memorial Hospital ended up being Lee Harvey Oswald's psychiatrist in the early 50s. So there's all kinds of really creepy connections going on there. All that to say is the show's in the archives, Lamar Waldron's show. The pictures are there for you to download also for free and examine. All kinds of shows there. We did a whole series on UFOs in July. How many of you knew that Canada had its own Roswell? Well, we do. And we had the guy on to tell us about it. And it was in Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia, 1967. It's a riveting show. We had Stanton Friedman on, of course. Stanton Friedman has a dual citizenship, unbeknownst to me. He's a Canadian also, because he says, hey, Stanton Friedman, if you've ever seen any documentaries on the Discovery Channel or History Channel on UFOs, he's the good-looking guy with the glasses and the beard. He's called the father of Roswell. He's the one that really initiated the investigation into it. He's been on Larry King and all the rest of the shows. He's um, quite an interesting fellow to speak with. Very knowledgeable, kind of the granddad of, of all the UFO information. That shows there for you to download for free. There's shows on 2012. Speaking of 2012, in March, we're going to be having a whole series on 2012. More on that as the guests get confirmed. But just to tell you, in March 2010, coming up. Dan Aykroyd's dad's going to be with us at the end of January, and he's going to be talking about Dan growing up in a haunted house and uh, the inspirations that Dan took with him from that haunted house and made Ghostbusters with. So that's going to be a lot of fun to speak to Dan Aykroyd's dad in January. So lots of stuff coming up. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Right now, folks, we're speaking with Jeff Belanger. And Jeff Belanger's got a great book out called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. It's the second book of a series of encyclopedias of haunted places. And what he's done is something remarkable. He's taken stories from right around the world. When you read the book and you read the stories, the location kind of drifts away to the background. And all of a sudden, you're looking at these stories and the people in them as people, not as an ethnic person. And I think because of that, uh, it brings people together. It's funny if ghosts are going to be the thing to finally do it, but you never know. All that to say is the book is available, Chapters Indigo, right across the country. And it's a great book. Back to Jeff. Jeff, before the break, I wanted to ask you, I was making reference to Michelle de Roche from Canada's Most Haunted and how she was dealing with a demon and uh, trying to exercise it, not from a inside a person, but it was just in and around. Just a, just a regular demon? Just, you know, no, under the not Satan. Not Satan, sorry. I'm not interested. You're not Boring. Okay. Sorry, man. Boring. <laughs> you want the real demon. Yeah. <laughs> Wake me up when you're done. <laughs> this picture, what's, the, this picture, what's the scariest thing that happened to me? Yeah. Uh, my, mine involved the living. <laughs> they really scare the hell out of me. Okay. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, I, it takes all kinds, but at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, some of the stupid things you hear people doing, um, you know, the trespassing, the, the making a mess of things, the theories that don't hold any water if you think about it for more than two seconds, that's the stuff that, that kind of scares me. Um, when I'm out there, when I'm at, in haunted locations, and even when something happens on the very, very rare occasion that it does, I'm usually excited. I want to see it. I want to. I want to. I want my brain to slow down and take it all in, and then I want to, you know, run through and say, mm -hmm. okay, what could, what could it possibly be? Am, am I overtired? Am I sober? Is this? Is the lighting doing this? Is someone playing a trick on me? You know, these kinds of things. And uh, and then when you run through all that and you take everything off the table and you go, wow, geez. I don't know. I don't know what's what's left. 
Um, so, yeah, no, I, I haven't I haven't been rattled by anything other than just you know general nonsense from living people. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Good good answer to a good question. Let's talk about religion and spirituality. Do you ever get hate mail from religious zealots? Sure I do. And um You do, eh? Huh? I do. And and um I not that much though. Not that much, but uh-huh. um w- one of the things that's uh that's interesting to me, I, I I'm just stating a fact it all comes from Christians. I, I haven't had hate mail from other uh, religious dom- denominations, and um, and I'm pretty quick to to quote the Bible. I mean, geez, it's interesting, you know, in mm-hmm. the chapter where Jesus comes back from the dead and appears before his disciples mm. in the in the Bible, Jesus uses the word ghost twice in just you know two three sentences away from each other, where he says, you know, you look frightened as if you've seen a ghost. I'm not a ghost. I'm flesh and blood. And uh, he doesn't say there's no such thing as ghosts. You silly ninnies. It's you know. He, mm-hmm. He, he says ghost and, and uses it. Uh, ghost, the idea, the concept of ghost appears in the Bible all over the place. Um, I don't believe that to study this is counter to religion at all, although I certainly understand how some people uh, find that it doesn't fit neatly inside the belief system, and so then, therefore, it must be heresy. That's too bad. You know, We're just going to have to agree to disagree when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I said, when I was in college, I was almost an atheist, and and ghosts have been my personal attempt to kind of claw my way back. I miss it. I miss, you know, I was raised Catholic, and I miss okay. the feeling I got, you know, as a kid, believing all of it, you know, believing that it was all there, and, and God was taking care of me, and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and so through ghosts, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to claw my way back to what exactly is going on, and, uh, and if there are ghosts and something does happen after we die, which is as far as I've gotten, by the way. Um, you know, I hate to, to give it away here, you know, before the show's ready for its, its dramatic climax, but uh, the conclusion I've come to in 15 years of looking into ghosts is that something happens after we die. Pretty profound, huh? That's deep. Yeah, That's deep. No, I, I don't know if I could quite make a book out of that, but <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that'd be number three. <laughs> yeah, no, I sometimes open my lectures with that. Just you know, I'm giving it away here, right in the front. So if you want to leave and go get a bite, <laughs> here's the here's the payoff. There you that, go. That's the conclusion I've come to so far. Now, now, what comes next and all that other stuff? Boy, I don't know. And I think it's interesting that people have such detailed theories on it. When how can you know? You know, how can you know until you actually cross over? Until you and cross that? over. That's right. Yeah, and, and figure it out. But um, but my gut tells me something, and uh, and and that this is a spiritual quest and endeavor that I'm on, and that that touches on all other aspects of of uh, the human experience, which is so interesting to me. Um, and, and I'm just going to keep trying to find my own answers and, and happy to pass along everything I learned along the way. It's funny you mentioned that Christ said um, the thing about the ghosts, which tells me that he believed there are ghosts, that it was probably convention back then for people to see the dead. Yeah, I, I, well, you know, one of the questions that I've, I've asked my, the, uh, the sociologist in me, I guess, is that if what came first, you know, did religion come first or did, you know, millennia ago someone saw someone who they knew to be dead, who mm. they knew in life, and said, my goodness, you know, there's this person is now transcending death itself. I'm seeing them. They're, they're a ghost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and were belief systems brought up around that, you know, to try to explain that, that phenomena? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, but, but my gut tells me that ghosts certainly would, would play a pretty good role if I were trying to build a religion, um, which I may one day if I need the money. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. I'll let you know on the ground floor. <laughs> okay, you let me know. Um, reincarnation. Do you believe? Yeah, yeah. In re- do you believe in reincarnation? Oh God, I don't know. You know, on the one hand, as a writer, I guess I have to because um, you know anyone who works in some kind of creative field, you're, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, you're any musician begins by trying to emulate the people that they uh, that inspired them. You know, try, if you're a guitar player, you try to play like Eddie Van Halen or, or whoever. Uh, blew you away when you were a kid, and then eventually you you develop your own style based on all those influences. But Eddie Van Halen's still a part of you. Now I recognize Eddie Van Halen is still alive, <laughs> but but if, but you know I mean Shakespeare who influenced you know someone else and Chaucer and, and all these other mm-hmm. giants and F. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean these are all people I've read and and have inspired me in some way. So in, in the one hand, you know, gosh, I think 
we get recycled all the time. And maybe that's that's part of the reason I wanted to be a writer is I wanted to leave kind of a permanent mark. Um, I hope. <laughs> I hope my books can hang around a little longer than I do. <laughs> I, think that's the, I think that's the dream of every writer, you know, that, man, you know, I hope these things are, are still in print or still hanging around even after I'm gone. Long um, after you're gone. Here's open, you know. Uh, you realize that doesn't happen for an awful lot of people, but but that's the dream anyway. Maybe it's the narcissist in us. Uh. No, I can't see why it wouldn't happen. Book's called Encyclopedia of Haunted Places, folks. Our guest tonight, Jeff Bomalage. Jeff, do you play an instrument? I do. I play guitar. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I've, I've been playing guitar since I was a kid. Oh, very cool. Um, what kind of guitar do you have? I've got six. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a sickness. I've got uh, I I play electric, but my mainly I play acoustic. I've got twelve strings, and I've got uh, an electric acoustic and Ibanez that that I like, and uh, and I've even uh, you know tinkered with songwriting along the way. Oh, you have? Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, I, I I wrote a. Uh, in fact, it, it's kind of cool. I wrote a um, a song last year called "My Christmas Tree Is Haunted." <laughs> <laughs> I, for some reason, I just saw Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. Yeah, you know no, because it's it, just a skeleton, right? Okay, anyways, yeah. the, the story gets funnier. Um, I, I actually have some really talented friends and family, and um, so I wrote the song and, and got some some friends to record it. And um, it, this was you know mid December last year, and I sent it out to some of the paranormal radio shows that I've been on and said, hey, you know, if you want to play this in December, you know, by all means, have at it. And I just think it's fun funny to let it get out there. Yeah. Well, over the summer, one of my friends called me and said, hey, look, you know, I, I every year I produce a, an album called Rock for Christmas, which is a charity album um, that features songs by like Cheap Trick and Eddie Money. Could we use your song for this year's <laughs> CD? And so I just went to the uh, the benefit concert the other night. I met, you know, hung out with Eddie Money and, <laughs> and kind of fun, eh? Yeah. So there, there's this there's a CD that just came out that's got my song, "My Christmas Tree Is Haunted" on it with Cheap Trick and Eddie Money, and uh, <laughs> and it's all for charity. Who would have thought? That's great. That's yeah. terrific, Jeff. Congratulations. No, I know. It, it, it's it's uh, you know, I'm just living the dream. What can I say? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, Eddie Money's no, you know. That's great. Yeah, no, yeah, it was funny. Trick, yeah, yeah. Did you get it the jam and all? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, there's a picture of us together floating around there on the internet if uh, if, if you want to look for it. But yeah, no, it was... Um, it, it's just it's just kind of a surreal experience, and and I don't know. I I think it's okay to have fun with the paranormal too. I think one of the problems that uh, everybody gets so caught up in it that it's oh it's got to be so deadly serious. I think actually through humor, through through lightening things up a bit, you can actually reach more people. Because I mean, let's face it, sometimes it's pretty weird to go to go sit out in the field and look at the stars all night and wait for a UFO to come by. I mean, you know, come on. That could be crazy. But at the same time, some people see things and, and have really profound life experiences that they take with them forever. So it's not crazy for those individuals. But if we can crack a few jokes about it and get people to lighten up, yeah. Yeah. I actually think that we can contribute more to the discussion than if you were to get really heavy-handed <laughs> and start talking about you know theories and this and that and what happens after we die in the next stage and reincarnated and, and all that other stuff. So, to teach with humor, absolutely. 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 So my Christmas tree is haunted. The ball's shimmy and shake and the lights half of them are out it's, it's haunted no doubt that's lots of fun do you play in a band at all no no it's my musical aspirations remain oh, in the basement oh, I see. but uh but i i i um i i it's a, it's a great outlet for me because writing was my hobby years ago and it became my job and as much as i love it and, and i i really am living the dream one still needs a hobby <laughs> so uh and so it yeah, right. So music became that, which is good. This is my hobby, by the way. I compose music for television and film. Oh, as, good. For a living, actually, NASA and all those guys, ABC. So when I uh, came to Sudbury from Montreal uh, with the winter looming in front of me, Sudbury's a small town of 170,000 people. I knew I was going to have to keep busy, so I started this show. <laughs> no, that's, that's... And it's taken off like a rocket. I had no idea I would ever do this. You see, I was a fan of George's. And Arts sure. and Ian's for years in Montreal. You can't get the show outside of major urban areas, unfortunately, in Canada. So right. I said, why not start a show? And the damn thing just flew. I mean, all the university stations have it now right across the country. It's terrific. That's great. Yeah, no, that's, a that's a lot of fun. You know, it, Art Bell is, I mean, oh yeah, he started it. I mean, he defined, he defined paranormal radio that's all those right. years ago. Yeah. And now, oh my gosh, as I'm sure you know, the the, the 
waves are flooded, especially if you include internet radio. Just there's so many hundreds of shows. I don't even know how they, they can survive. Well, well, they survive because no one's even in it to try to make any money or any ad dollars. They just can't. You know, yeah, there's just, no money in it. Yeah. yeah, right. No, no, no. And I yeah. understand. And so you have to love it, which is kind of neat. That's that's you know there's something pure about that. But yeah, Art Bell, just a, a legend. Absolute and, legend. And, Absolute. And, yeah. And, uh, and 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 so cool that I, I, I I've, I've I've never had the pleasure actually of uh, of talking with him. But I wonder what he thinks if he ever does a Google search for paranormal radio show and sees how many hundreds are out there, both terrestrial and mainly internet, of course. Um, you know, all who really may not even have heard of him, however, <laughs> owe him <laughs> quite a bit. Everything. It's kind of like uh, how rock musicians own uh, oh, the old blues artists, everything, you know? The same of course. Thing. Yeah, that's right. Same yeah, some, some don't even realize where it came from, but uh, but that is that is it. It was Art Bell. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host... Brent Holland. Let's go back to Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us another story? Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll tell you about one of, great, tell you great one of my most profound experiences actually occurred in France. And uh, I was in the catacombs of Paris. Yes. I've been there, been there twice now. Mm-hmm. And this was, uh, God, the first time I think was 2003, maybe two. Uh, I was over there completely alone. And I, I, it's it's where I wanted to go first. I know some people go to the Louvre or the Musée d'Orsay, but uh, not me. I, I want to go below ground and look for dead people. Uh, <laughs> that's how I roll. <laughs> that's kind of fun. So yeah, no. So, so I, I got over there, and uh, my my French is uh, okay. It's uh, mezza mezza, as they say. And, and I was Mais Monsieur to... Belanger, you've got to be French Canadian there somewhere. Yeah, oh yeah, right, sure. Yeah. It, yeah, and it's funny because when I'm in when I'm in Canada or France, I pronounce it Belanger, but here in in America, uh-huh. it's actually Belanger. Oh, is it really? Yeah, no, but I, I when in Canada, when in France, I I freely pronounce it the French way, and, okay. and I'm happy to do so. Uh, and and so uh, so I'm over there, and I and I managed to get some help and find where this place is, and I get below ground, and and I'm walking through, and I know what's down there, but you don't know what to expect. You're 25 meters mm-hmm. below the city. It, it, it's quiet. There's the only thing you hear is just water seeping through all that old limestone, and you realize this is the reason Paris was such a, a great city. This started two thousand years ago. They found all this great limestone to build with. The Romans did, and so it grew and grew and grew. And eventually, they, to get to the limestone, they had to tunnel three hundred kilometers of tunnels all underneath the city. In the mid seventeen hundreds to eighteen hundreds, they had a problem. The city's getting big, dense. Uh, compact, and the ground below is hollow. It's a recipe for disaster. The other problem was that the cemeteries, which when you build a city, you put your cemeteries on the outskirts of the city, which they did. However, after centuries, the outskirts aren't the outskirts anymore. The city grew around them uh, to the point where they couldn't grow, and the cemeteries are overflowing. So they had to empty the bones. Uh, they had to empty the bodies from these cemeteries and fill these tunnels. And you go down there, and you finally get to the doorway that says, stop, this is the empire of the dead, in French, of course. Mm-hmm. And, and you walk through, and there's six million human skeletons waiting for you on the other side. And I was totally alone. The lighting is low. Rows and rows of skulls and bones in a very macabre, intricate, uh, stacked pile all around you. And it takes your breath away. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. You mean, there, I, it, to give you an idea, if I were to stretch my fingertips out in both directions, I would be touching human skulls with both uh, both fingers. That's and, and there's parts of that tunnel where I have to duck to keep walking. And as I'm walking through, I'm in one narrow passageway, completely alone, and I see a shadow the size of a man move from the right side to the left and back again. And I immediately look down at my feet. My shadow's right where it belongs. The lighting is very low. It's shoulder level aiming down. So it's it's not like if there was light on the floor aiming up, a little mouse could cast a great big shadow. It wasn't like that. And so I'm going through the data banks in my mind saying, what could this be? There's no other outlets. There's no side passages. There's nowhere to go. And that's the way out. <laughs> I have to keep walking toward it. And that's the kind of event where it was exciting. Time slowed down. You're going, wow, what is this? Uh, and it's just an incredible experience that I'll never forget. And, and can I get out if you're alive? And yeah, well, I, I really, I, I don't think I, 
I, I, I mean, I guess I'd be lying to say I wasn't afraid at all, um, because it is a, an odd experience. It's something out of the norm. But uh, fear was not the prominent, you know, feeling I had. It, intrigue, you know, was was certainly the biggest part of it. And uh, of course, I did keep walking. I, uh, I'm here now talking to you, so obviously, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I did keep walking. And, uh, and and you realize, number one, disturbing a place of the dead is kind of a universal taboo. All cultures frown That's on right. that. That's right. Mm-hmm. And but Paris had no choice. The living will always take precedent. And Paris had no choice. They had to empty these cemeteries because people were getting sick. They were overflowing with corpses, literally. And they had to close up these tunnels because buildings were collapsing into the hollowed out ground below. And so I was thinking, you know, the only way they could show any kind of respect, because there's no way to know who's who. I mean, there's signs that tell you roughly what cemetery this came from, but there's no way to know, you know, who's who's who. Who's 60, who? Gen- yeah. 60 generations of Parisians down there. The only way they could show any kind of respect, I think, was to make it a very deliberate and almost beautiful uh, design where they, you know, they stacked them in such a way. They didn't just throw them in a pile. It was a very deliberate, this cross is made of skulls, Valentine hearts made of skulls, arcs, rows, everything. And by the time you get done walking, it's, it's a little over a kilometer of, of this, you know, these tunnels, these beautiful tunnels made of human bones and skulls is very humbling you realize that these people all had to give up their eternal resting place so the city of Paris could grow and thrive and, and expand. And they didn't have a choice, of course. Um, you know, it, when you walk into a cemetery, every headstone speaks to you in some way. It, it, it identifies who's there, maybe a, an epitaph of some kind. Or a date or something. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, these you've got six million people that are just forced into one collective voice now. Um, this is their this is their cemetery now. It's it's there below the ground and not not completely forgotten. Um, but that's it was a, it was an amazing experience. And then to add a, a little insult to the uh, the injury, as you walk out, there was a security guard and I had a bag that had my cameras and stuff mm-hmm. in it. And he said, I need to check your bag. And I said, you know, gee, usually they check you going into a location. <laughs> and then, and then I realized I said, oh my goodness, you're looking for bones. And he turned around, and there was a little table behind him with three or four bones on it. And he said, that's from this morning. Holy cow. People take yeah. bones of people. That's got to be bad luck. Not that I'm a big believer in luck, but that, that couldn't be good for your luck. Oh, that's bad karma, baby. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't want to do that. That's for sure. Yeah. So I, I brought the skull back and put it back down. Oh, that was nice of you. Then. <laughs> I guess. With the glowing red eyes? Yes, right, that's yeah. it. Yeah. No, they did the same thing in Montreal. Dominion Square, I don't know for folks that are in Montreal right now, there's this big square in the middle of downtown Montreal, Peel Street, and the Sun Life Building is right across from it. That was Montreal's second graveyard, and they had to dig up all those bones, and uh, must have been quite a sight, macabre sight. And uh, they just moved them all up to the graveyard that's on top of the mountain now, Mount Royal. You know, we talked earlier about uh, horror movies and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Another favorite is... is you know, poltergeist, which I think was, was more fun than really, you know, keeps you up at night. However, there was an element of that movie where, you know, they, they move the, the headstones, but mm-hmm. not the graves. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you in years of researching this, how incredibly common that is. You're kidding. It happens all the time. They move the headstones, not the graves. That's one thing that that movie nailed. There's a, there's a library in Pittsburgh, um, that when they were they were laying the foundation, they just kept breaking open casket after casket as bodies spilled into the construction area. Oh. Here's the thing. Cemeteries, you know, mostly useless plots of land, let's face it. Once someone's been in the ground 40, 50 years, no one's coming to visit them anymore, unless they were famous. Um, you know, once you've got, you know, grandparents, once the grandchildren have, have grown up and, and died themselves, who, who's going to go visit those graves? Yeah, you're right. Right. Very few, yeah. you know, very few. Most of those graves don't don't get visited, and so uh, when cemeteries are forced to move for whatever reason, city ordinances or construction projects, often they'll reach out to the families and say, "Where do you want them moved to?" If no one answers that call, then they do what they got to do, and often that involves uh, not moving, you know, not moving the graves, just pulling up the headstones. It, it, there's there's so many cases here in Massachusetts. They uh, they had to move an entire town because they were flooding a valley to mm-hmm. create a, uh, a watershed and, and uh, 
for drinking water for Boston. And I spoke to someone who was one of the displaced people who said, you know, I went to the cemetery and I saw every headstone gone, but I didn't see any of the dirt disturbed to uh, to dig that up. And that's, oh. drinking, that's drinking water. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Enjoy that, Boston. <laughs> Oops, I got something in my cup here. Yeah. 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 So oh, uh, it, it happens It happens all the time. And I didn't know it, that. It, you know, that is disrespectful. One of the questions that people sometimes ask is, why would a cemetery be haunted? You know, I mean, if you could go anywhere as a ghost, why would you hang around there? It would mm. be kind of boring. Um, but I think that has a lot more to do with the living than the dead, our, our own inevitable fate. I think so, too. We're coming up to the bottom of the hour. When we come back, though, I want to ask you about triggers. And if there's any triggers out there that happen to you, for example, a hair in the back of your head or perhaps cold spots and those types of things, and if they get reported in some of the stories that you hear, and if there's some commonalities there that people should look out for if they think that they have a haunted house or something, and what are some of the triggers that people could look for when we come back from the break? We're just going to go through this very quickly because we're running out of time, and there's a lot of stuff I want to get to with you. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Folks, if you're just joining us, I am glued to my seat. We're speaking with Jeff Belanger. He's got a great book out called The Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Looking for a Christmas gift? This could be the answer. Encyclopedia of Haunted Places is available at Chapters Indigo right across the country. I was in our local chapters here in Sudbury, and it was right there on the shelf. No problem at all. So... You'll be able to find it, no problem. If you can't get it at your local chapters in go, just go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website. Click on the book cover there. That'll take you right to chapters in go. You can order it online. To, you know, probably be there within 24, 48 hours maximum. Jeff Belanger also has a website that he collects ghost stories with, and that website is called ghostvillage.com. Now, once again, an easy way to get there. Just go to the www.nightfright website. Jeff Belanger's name, of course, is underlined and highlighted. There's a link there. It's in blue. Just click on that. That'll take you right to his website. you got some great ghost stories. Go for it. Just email them to him. And uh, I know everybody has something weird that has happened to them that's unexplainable. That's what we're discussing tonight. Right now, you are listening to CKLU 96.7 FM at Laurentian University, where we broadcast every Wednesday from 10 p.m., to midnight. I want to say hi to Deborah Frankel. How you doing, Deborah? Hope things are well with you. And I want to thank you for finding the funding every week to keep this show on the air. I want to say hi to Matthew Burke over at Cape Breton University in Sydney, Nova Scotia, where he broadcasts the show every Wednesdays from 3.30 p.m. to 5.30 in the afternoon. That's Caper Radio, CILU 102.7 FM, Lakehead University in Rock and Thunder Bay. And that's Monday nights at midnight. I want to say hi to Jason Wellwood. Saturday nights, 10 to midnight in Sherbrooke, Quebec, one hour south of my old hometown of Montreal. The voice of the Eastern Township, CJMQ 88.9 FM, my good buddy David Teasdale. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde, et à joyeux Noël. CJUM 101.5 FM, University of Manitoba. Canada is blessed with all these great, beautiful, stunningly beautiful universities. Winnipeg is just another one. University of Manitoba and Winnipeg. Winnipeg, Manitoba, of course, folks, Wednesday nights, Thursday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. Jared McKittiak, hope things are well with you. Road Dog, keep going, buddy. Don't get down, you know. People want to support your radio station. They're there for you. They're listening. They want you guys to succeed. Sound FM, 100.3 FM, of course, I'm talking about. The University of Waterloo, Waterloo, Ontario. They broadcast three of these shows every week, folks. Sunday nights, Monday mornings, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And I got a lot of uh, email from truckers that are going across the country that listen to the show for that amount of time, six hours. That's incredible. Friday nights at midnight, CKXU 88.3 FM, University of Lethbridge, Lethbridge, Alberta. And I want to say hi to Alan Gillespie, Amos Evans, CIVL 88.7 FM, University of the Fraser Valley, Abbotsford, British Columbia, Thursdays, 2 p.m. and Friday mornings at 2 a.m. 
CFAD 92.1 FM, Salamo Radio in Salamo and Ymir, British Columbia, Saturday evenings, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. You're listening right now, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Gerald, the Hutch Hutchman, CFUR 88.7 FM, University of Northern British Columbia, Prince George, British Columbia, Friday night, Saturday mornings, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. My good buddy Christopher Earl there. Kurt Wetter over at CFXU 93.3 FM, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, Saturdays from 10 to midnight. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. www.nightfrightshow.com Go to the archives. In the archives, Don Ledger has a show. It was, uh, I think we did it back in July, July 7th, something like that. We talked about Canada's Roswell. I bet you didn't know Canada has a Roswell. Well, there was, you know, it was the height of the, the Cold War also, folks. So every time something weird happened, and it certainly did there, NORAD was called. So we had all these ships, U.S. forces, Canadian forces, submarines, all headed to Nova Scotia, trying to figure out what had crashed in the sound there in Shag Harbor. The show is amazing. I don't want to give too much of it away. I want you to go and download it. It's all free downloads. All the shows are there for you download. Michelle Deschamps was here talking about UFOs, and we talked about Roswell, of course, in Area 51. You're going to have fun with that one also. That's there for you to download. All kinds of great shows there, and this one will be there next week, guaranteed. No problem whatsoever. As I had mentioned before, Michelle de Roche was here at Canada's Most Haunted. She was investigating a little girl that was around four or five years old, and she was complaining to her mother that she had a little friend that kept showing up. Well, as it turned out, this little friend was anything but little and anything but friendly. That show was there also for you to listen to. Deborah Conway, who's the president of JFK Lancer, and that, of course, is John F. Kennedy's Secret Service nickname. She was here talking about all the work that they do to try and figure out what happened. I have my own ideas there. I do think it was a conspiracy without hesitation. And the reason why I say that is there seems to be some scientific proof of that. We had a woman by the name of Sherry Feaster on, and Sherry is a CSI, a senior CSI crime scene investigator from Dallas. She took a look at the Spruder film. The Spruder film, folks, is a very famous film that you always see Kennedy being assassinated in. And she took a look at that She used modern technology, modern trigonometry, all the modern science that is available that was not available in 1963. And guess what she found by looking at the blood spatter patterns? A frontal shot. Senior CSI. She has put people behind bars using the same science that she used on the Sapruder film. Now, if that doesn't tell you something, mm mm-hmm. We had a show, Phil Spencer was here. We talked about Bigfoot. That was a lot of fun also. All those shows, folks, I want to get back to Jeff. All those shows are there for you to download free. No problem whatsoever. Enjoy. Have a good time with them. You're listening to Night Fright. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Jeff Belanger is here with us tonight, and I'm having a blast talking to Jeff. He's so knowledgeable, and we're talking about in-depth things, details about ghosts and things of that nature. His book, of course, is in the Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. And what I love about this book is it's not just stories from one area. It's stories from right around the world, and there's a commonality there. As you know, on the, on the website, my website, I have one from Zimbabwe where he talks about witch doctors. And Jeff, I don't know if you know this, but witch doctoring was outlawed for a while in Zimbabwe. Well, they've just reinstated it. Thank goodness. So there you go. You see? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, that, that's. Uh, Isn't that old... interesting? Yeah, no. It, it's it's interesting that it would be outlawed. Actually, I think more. I think mm-hmm. that's more interesting than the fact that uh, that people. You know, go to them. Uh, you know, for as long as there've been people, there's been shamans. And Absolutely. Healers, and, you Absolutely. Know, we we call them all kinds of labels, witch, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. But um, but the reality is, when when this when the sticks are the the 
chips are stacked against you, these are the people that uh, we've always sought out. And um, there's, a, there's a great story in Rhode Island, in Exeter, oh, sure, Rhode God. Island, uh, about Mercy Brown. She was the last um, American vampire. And uh, this was the 1890s, which really is, from a historical perspective, is kind of modern times. Uh, so modern that the Providence mm-hmm. Journal, the big newspaper for Rhode Island, covered it, uh, covered this story. Mercy Brown had died in the winter, and uh, a couple months later, it, it was determined that she was possibly a vampire because the Brown family was wiped out by consumption, tuberculosis. And back then, um, you know, if science didn't have a remedy, folklore did. And they said, you know, you need to identify the vampire and kill it so it will stop ravaging the family. Well, Mercy Brown's body had moved. She was kept in a keep because uh, in mm-hmm. northern climes back then, before the days of embalming, uh, you couldn't dig in the ground until the spring. So you'd put That's them right. in mm-hmm. what's almost like a you know a little stone shed um, to keep the body in there. Well, the body had moved, which. Um, People who study decomposition can tell you that's that's not that uncommon. Muscles contract and expand, gases you know expand and, and leak, and bodies can groan, move, all kinds of things. Well, uh, her, her body moved, and they said, well, this this is proof that she must be the vampire. And her own father took her heart out of her chest, burned it on a rock, and, and fed it, fed, fed the ashes to his son, who also had tuberculosis. And it sounds so barbaric. Even the Providence Journal, you know, the tone of the story was, look at what these crazy bumpkins are doing down in southern Rhode Island. But the reality was, if your family, your wife was, was you know, taken by consumption, your your other daughter taken by consumption, Mercy was taken by consumption, and now your son has it, you, you'll try anything. And, and, and Mercy's already dead to you. So, uh, you know, these, these folklore remedies have been around a lot longer than, uh, <laughs> you know, then we want to give them credit for, and you need to try something. And that's that's the promise of witch doctors and, and everything else, that if life is spiraling out of control, you can at least make an attempt and through intent or whatever, try to, you know, try, try to control these variables. Mercy Brown is also one of the great ghost stories of Rhode Island. Uh, people report seeing spook lights above her grave and, and that cemetery in Exeter and, uh, and, and, and People who are vampire fans, and now, my gosh, that's uh, mm. that's it's so obnoxious. So, you know, vampires are not beautiful teenage boys and girls. You know, they they were the traditional vampires, Nosferatu, and you know, yes. the, these these the, mm. decrepit Walking Dead. That was the original vampire, um, not beautiful, sexy creatures. Although uh, <laughs> they've know, romanticized that, it to the point of ludicrousness, as far as yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's no longer sexy. scary. No, I know it's, it's appealing. It's sexy, yeah, it's a sexy thing, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mercy wasn't sexy. She was she was a consumption victim, and and that's and that has some draw too for people that are you know vampire fanatics because they they hear about her and they go wait by her grave and they see things and, uh, and that also adds to the uh, adds to the legend to the lore also. Yep. Before the break, I was asking you. I suspect you probably get a plethora of emails that say, "I think my house is haunted. How do I tell?" Yeah, I, you know. The, the thing that's interesting about um, uh, haunted homes mm-hmm. is that when you live anywhere, your apartment, your your house, whatever, uh, when you live there for not that long, I mean, say a month or more, uh, you start to really know your environment. You you know that the third step creaks when you step on the right side at night. You know the various sounds that your particular house makes as it settles on cold nights, on windy nights, and all that other stuff. And so... To me, homeowners are are pretty good judges of when something's out of the ordinary because, you know, think about it. You hear someone walking around downstairs, you jump up, you have an intruder. Uh, I talk to a lot of police officers. That's always very interesting because the police are are many times the the first ones on the scene Mm -hmm. for a ghost. Is that right? Oh, sure. Hey, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear someone walking around downstairs, don't get your EMF meter or Ouija board. Call the police. Call the police. (laughs) You know, because it may be an intruder. Well, the police get called to the same home sometimes, even though new owners come and go, and the people are sane and sober, you know, and and, and telling the same story. I heard someone walking around down here. I was sure I had a burglar, but they look around, and everything's secure and safe, and the police know that, gee, we get called to this house, you know, periodically. Uh, The last owner used to call us out, same thing. You have a ghost, <laughs> you know. I mean, well, what else? 
can you say? Yeah, really. What, yeah. what else can you say? There's no sign of breaking. Nothing's missing. Everything's secure. But but you you, you know you you seem credible and sane and sober. And so uh, so people know their their house. They know their environment. I always tell folks, get out a just a good old fashioned notebook and a pen and start documenting. Because you want to keep track what's going on, when and where, what happened, what are the circumstances around it. Mm-hmm. You may find a pattern, and you may debunk it. You might be able to say, gee, you know, it, I, it is only on cold nights that this stuff happens. So I'm thinking the house is just creaking and popping, uh, you know, because it's so cold outside. Or there, maybe you're going to establish something. Either way, if you bring in some kind of ghost investigator, that's so that information is so valuable. So, But how can you tell? You know your house. Um, just like, I don't know if you have kids, but you know when your kid's sick before mm-hmm. they do. Absolutely. You Absolutely. know? Yeah. How do you tell? I don't know. You want to call that psychic? Sure. Yeah, you can if you want, or just so in tune with your own offspring that you can look at them and go, you know what? You're you're a little bit pale. You're moving a little sluggish. Mm-hmm. You're getting sick. Um, now, if you want to talk about something that's terrifying, it is when your kid is sick. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah right. I mean, that's really terrifying. Yeah, you're you're so uh, you're so helpless. You know, you you want to you want to fix them and, and make it better and take it away and uh, and you can't. And so and so, I think same with hauntings. You know your environment. You're you're the best judge for these kind of things. You, your senses are as good as mine. I have no special abilities. Uh, if someone's got working eyes and ears and. Uh, and is experiencing this stuff, yeah, you might have something going on. I say document it. That's, and that also gives you some sense of control mm-hmm. in a situation that's otherwise uncontrollable. So looking for patterns and, and looking for commonalities, those types of things. Sure. Yeah, you might explain it away, or at the very least, you, you've you got the start of a great story. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll give you your, uh, and you can send it right off to Jeff, folks, by well, or, you know, ghostvillage.com. <laughs> I don't have to do them all. You can you can write your own book too. <laughs> You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now, and now your host, Brent Holland. I want to ask you: Is there a time of year, or perhaps a pattern, when people send you their stories? Yeah, I, I, October oh, there it is. Yeah, October certainly you know perks up because of Halloween. And but again, I think that that has nothing to do with more ghosts coming around in October, but more people being uh, talking about ghosts. People that are you know don't think about it much, but are, but have to think about it in October because they're being inundated with scary movies and and you know people like me on the radio. It, it's funny, you know, your show is paranormal, so you get to cover this stuff all year round. All year round, but, yeah. But oh my goodness, you know, I, in the week up to Halloween, it's it's not uncommon for me to be on fifty to up to one hundred radio shows. Yeah, I bet. You, you I know, bet. for for four to six minutes at a time, <laughs> you know, one yeah. after the other, all morning long. Yeah. You know, re- regular mainstream radio shows that are like, oh, so you're into ghosts, you know? Tell us about that, and then they go to commercial, and we're all done. Um, and so we right, next, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so regular folks are inundated with that kind of stuff uh, in October, and I think it gets them thinking. So, um, but but I, I don't believe that there's that there's a, a you know a seasonality to it. Um, and, and as far as more ghost sightings occurring at night, I think that has more to do with things are quiet at night. You know, you don't have uh, you know during the day that that same phenomenon might be there, but you don't have cars. You know, driving by all day long, people hustling and bustling in and out of a building. Focus. Um, it, it's quiet. Mm. Your senses are, are sharper. Um, you, the environment's more still, and you're going to pick up on subtleties better than if it were busy. I agree. It's funny, you know, I gravitate towards the night to compose sure. for those same reasons. Well, the people leave me the heck alone. <laughs> I think this is it. And the phone usually. Doesn't, usually the phone doesn't ring. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. It's so hard. No, I understand. I mean, yeah. I, when, when well, I'm on yeah, deadline, sure. yeah. yeah. When I'm on deadline, I have to. You know, sometimes it just comes down to I have to put down a certain amount of words per day if I'm going to make my deadline with That's any right. kind of, you know, normalcy. And mm-hmm. and uh, you know, hey, life goes on throughout the day. The phone rings. People need stuff. You have meetings. Mm-hmm. You have to. You have to go to and. You still got to make make your word count. So uh, sometimes it does get to be nighttime. Is there a question you had just mentioned being on a, tons of radio shows and television shows, etc., and you become quite a you have a reputation for being very very good as a as a guest. Is there a question that you always wish somebody would ask you that they never have? Oh man, uh, 
Not really. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, 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 I think it, um, it gets to be pretty standard. Uh, you know, it, it gets to be, um, it, 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 depending on the radio station, of course. You know, uh, if you're on like a, an FM rock station in the morning, they just <laughs> tell us a ghost story and then go away. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, I understand that. Um, but when you're on, you know, the longer talk shows and you can get more in depth, um, I, I, I like, the stuff that interests me the most, I recognize, may not be as compelling for mass audiences, and that's that's the, you know, the, the theories behind the theories. That's the stuff that's uh, that's nitty gritty. Um, that's what I I spend my time thinking about. But that's appropriate for books, and I recognize that. I agree. Uh, yeah, that's what intrigues me. You know, when I first started this show, they said, "Well, you're going to do a half hour, an hour." I said, "No, I want to do two at least, because that way we can get into the meat." of this show, the guts, and get into the philosophies behind it, and the, perhaps the science behind it, too. So perhaps it's the same way for you. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, um, I, I, you know, will these mystery, mysteries be solved? They will, and, and they are being solved, but they're on individual basis, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's all I'm trying to do, is figure it out for myself. I, I, I gave up long ago trying to prove to the world that ghosts are real or not. I mean, ghosts are real, let there be no doubt what they are. That's what we can debat, debate. Um, you know, but, but at the same time, I, I, you know, I, you, you look at like the Catholic church, the resources they have, the billions of dollars, the real estate, the, the, the billion plus followers, you know, in, in 2000 years or so, they haven't been able to capture a hundred percent market share. So I don't know what chance I have of convincing the world <laughs> that there are ghosts around us and they're real. <laughs> That's a funny way to put it, 100% market share. I like uh, that. That's good. You know, I mean, yeah. I can try, but... Uh, I understand. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just me. Um, <laughs> well, let's talk about religion. How is your spirituality since you uh, since you started this career? I call it a career because it is definitely a career. Yeah, it? sure. No, this is what I do full time. Is I mean, it more I, profound? Is it less profound? Is it more? I, you know, I, I don't think I could be any more confused. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't have the answers. Definitely not. I'm, I'm no spiritual guru. I just think it's, uh, it's interesting, and I'm, and I'm trying to find out for myself. You know what works. I, I guess you know there was a time where I said you know all religions bad and wrong and evil, and then uh, I lightened up. I got older and softened you know my position quite a bit, and I realized you know there's a lot of good in just about all of them. Yeah. There's there's good things that people take away, Absolutely. and boy they're the lucky ones you know because when you belong to a, a, a large religious belief system, you've got a whole support structure there, and so if you if you bought in and if you're on board with that, boy you're you're, you're blessed <laughs> because you've got that. Then there's the rest of us, um, and, and I'm realizing one of the things that's that's interesting and frightening about ghosts is that, particularly paranormal investigation, is really becoming a belief system uh, with its dogmas, with its mm. prophets and, and clergy and, and, and everything else. And that, of course, being people with their own TV shows, uh, which is frightening because I've heard some arguments where people are arguing about the way to do things based on what they saw on television shows. And you say, "Oh goodness gracious, people! You know that that's that's not good." Reality um, check. How do you feel about the the plethora of shows that are out there now? Do you feel there are some that are legitimate, some that are just out there to make a buck? I, here's the thing: TV is there to entertain, and and that's not a bad thing. You know, I mean, uh, if you're entertained in, in the way that they they are doing things, then then great. It, it's raised a lot of awareness. Some of them, I think, are kind of frightening because. You know, television does have the ability to affect society and, mm -hmm. and, ch and change views. And as I mentioned earlier, with, with all the demon stuff, um, you know, boy, every now and then you hear a news story about, uh, you know, got a woman in Chicago who shot and killed her four-year-old daughter because she said she had a demon in her. And, you know, was she watching these shows and reached that conclusion? You know, probably not. However, is it a matter of time before something like that happens? Mm. Pro probably. And that's that's the part that's really uh, that's really frightening. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think they all have something to say. They all contribute to this greater discussion. So, um, I, you know, I, I just I don't spend a lot of time thinking about television. Um, and I work for one of those shows. I work for a show on the Travel Channel that's uh, uh, Ghost Adventures, which is you know Friday nights on the Travel Channel, and that's been fun. It's been fun to to to, to show a ghost story visually to work on that that aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a, it, it's part of what got me interested as a kid. I'd watch these old ghost shows, you know, mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. television. And so 
there's ways to do it, certainly, where you can present the history and you can present the facts. And, and one of the things that I like about what we do in particular is that all you can do with an eyewitness is say, just tell us what you saw, where you saw it. People can choose not to believe them. That's certainly their prerogative. Absolutely. But it just comes down to, I was standing here, this is what I saw, this is what I felt, this is what I experienced. And that sets the stage for, for everything that helps, everything else that happens in the show. And, it, you know, in most cases, they believe. They truly yeah. believe this happened. And that's the nice thing about, you know, I can tell you, I talked to someone who had this incredible experience, but when you can see them through the, the medium of television, when you can see the person maybe get a little nervous, get a little shaken up, uh, looking around because they're mm. in the exact spot where it happened, Wow, I mean that's that's powerful stuff. It sure uh, is. You know that's and and I, I I like that. I like that that aspect of it. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now, and now your host, Brent Holland. We're gonna have to start to wrap up now, but I was wondering, can you tell us one more quick ghost story? Yeah, sure. One of the other places, and, and uh, all, pretty much all the places we've talked about tonight are in the book. Um, the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River, Massachusetts. Oh, which, uh, this one. Whoa, folks, yeah, put the yeah. lights on quick. Yeah, you know, got, you know, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her father 40 wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her mother 41. It's the old nursery rhyme. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Which is a, a gross exaggeration. It was only like 17 wax <laughs> that killed uh, the Borden, <laughs> Mr. Borden. Uh the house is, is done up to look just like it did um, back in the 1890s when someone came in and murdered two people in that house. Uh, the crime scene photos are even in the rooms. Um, you can you can you know you can see sit exactly where Mr. Borden was when he was killed. And today it's it's one of the great haunts. I had the opportunity. I've been there a number of times. I only live about an hour away from there. And I had an opportunity to go there when they were closed for renovations for a couple of weeks. Um, myself and three other people were, were given the keys for the night and said, you know, have fun, see, see what you can find. And we, uh, we actually did a live broadcast of a radio show. And then about 1130 at night, we were downstairs in the basement, all four of us, when we heard two sets of scampering footsteps right above us in the hallway. Ooh. And all four of us look at each other. And the first thing we thought of is, oh, man. We thought kids from Fall River had broken in. We got to go up there. We got to call the police. We're in charge for the night. We can't let anything happen to this place. We were up the stairs. It couldn't have been more than three or four seconds. And you look, and the door's locked, and you look around, and then we all look at each other again and say, okay. <laughs> all of us heard it. All of us reacted. All of us thought the same thing. There are two kids in here, and we need the police or whatever. And the place is secure. Mm. And, and you look around, and you... you you search for every possible expl explanation and nothing. And, uh, boy, it's stuff like that that just gets you energized and excited about this again and, and you know, wanting to document all you can and, and, and just keep exploring this because it's, it's, it's an amazing field with countless stories and, and lots of evidence to be gathered. Absolutely. And I think it's just starting. I think all the investigations and everything, and I think the science aspects of things will come along soon, too. And perhaps we'll find out one day, or perhaps not, what's really going on on the other side. Yeah. We can hope. We can hope. Jeff, it has been a pure delight to have you on the show tonight. Folks, Jeff Belanger, his book, of course, Encyclopedia of Haunted Places, can be gotten at Chapters Indigo right across the country. Go to the www.nightfrightshow.com website, click on the book cover. That'll take you to Chapters Indigo. You can order it right online or also right to the left of that tonight's guest. It's underlined, it's highlighted in blue. Jeff Melanger, click on that. That'll take you to ghostvillage.com. If you have any stories you want to share with Jeff, please do. And that would be uh, that would be my pleasure if, if folks share a bunch of stories from Canada and stuff for you to put in your next book. Sounds good. It has been a pleasure, my friend. I want to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to your next book and, and you having to come back on. Sounds great. Okay, my friend. All the best to you and yours. Thank you, Brent. You too. Thank you so much. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye. You're listening to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. The time is now. And now your host, Brent Holland. Jeff Belanger, folks. Wasn't that great?
What an incredible guest. Very knowledgeable, very articulate. A lot of history there. I had learned a lot tonight, especially the stuff about the White House and things like that. All our stories, by the way, Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Christmas is coming, and this is a good one for you to get. I have bought the book myself, and as I say, it's available chapters, and you go right across the country. If you know somebody who is interested in this type of material, they will love this book, guaranteed. There is something for everybody in this book. Jeff Melanger, the guest, Encyclopedia of Haunted Places. Next week, Canada's own storyteller, John Robert Colombo, Order of Canada winner. He will be here talking about his collection of ghost stories, Big Book of Canadian Ghost Stories. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> it's going to be one heck of a ride next week. He'll be here the first hour. The second hour, you remember that movie, The Mothman Prophecies, Richard Greer's movie? It kind of scared the bejesus out of me. The Mothman is a legend, and we're going to have an expert on in the second hour next week talking about the Mothman. Her name is Robin Bellamy. She's from Toronto, and she's done all kinds of research and has all kinds of insights about the Mothman and the Mothman prophecies next week on Night Fright. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. Sincerely, I hope you are all warm and had a good time tonight again www.nightfrightshow.com www.nightfrightshow.com Archives are free for you to download always. All the very best to you all. See you next week. Listening to Night Fright and your host, Brent Holland. The time is now. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. Troubled spirit, and um, it's a, a story from a woman who used to live in a, a working class area in Montreal called Verdun. Now, what's unique about Verdun? Verdun's a working class area, I guess, about uh, 125,000 people. And uh, during the Second World War, Verdun became famous because it had the most soldiers in the war per capita of any city in Canada. Uh, she writes, the houses date back to the late 1800s up to the 1950s. And the email reads, Hi Brent, good show, thank you. Ghost stories, I don't know if this is what you will call it, but here goes. The very first house I owned in Verdun was a two-story brown brick building. It was in a pleasant part of the street with a path in a small park directly across from us. There was a high school directly behind our backyard and it was always full of kids laughing and chattering. All in a positive place, nothing like a stereotypical haunted house with smoke and stuff oozing out. Our bedroom was on the second floor, right at the top of the stairs to the left. Our bathroom was just outside our bedroom door directly at the top and directly in front of the stairs. Anyone coming up the stairs could be heard and seen by anyone lying in bed by the time they were about halfway up. Now often, I was on my own at night as Andrew, my husband, worked a rotating shift, another woman at home alone. Sometimes when I would be by myself sleeping, I would wake up to hear footsteps coming up the stairs towards me alone in the bedroom. I fully expected to see my husband, but then no one would be there. Oh man. <laughs> On several occasions, when I would wake up during the night to roll over, I would always see a man walk into our bathroom or catch a look at him coming up the stairs. This went on for quite a while until finally I got up the courage to ask my next door neighbor a little bit about the history of the house. The neighbor was a longtime resident of the street and recalled the original owner. He related a story that kind of gave me the creeps though, not in a threatening or frightening way, more like a disturbing, this really happened way. 
He told me that the previous owner had lived there by himself and loved the place. It was his baby on the weekends, and he would do ongoing, turn the page, renovating and upkeep. One night, he left to go out, but the weather was bad. Uh, tragically, he was in a horrific car crash and was killed instantly. What's weird is after I learned this, I never saw the man again. Weird, eh? Hmm. That's too bad. I guess the guy really liked being at home and uh, putzing around and stuff. Okay, that from Montreal again, Brossard. <laughs> 